Namaste everyone. Welcome to the Charva podcast. This is your host Kushal Mehra as always uh, trying to bring in exciting conversations. Today we're going to be discussing a book uh, and the book's name is 16 Stormy Days and uh, I have to say I uh, I have been wanting to discuss this book with uh, with the author who's with us today uh, for quite some time because uh, let me tell you I have read this book twice actually because when I read the first time I was like I have to read it again so Tripur Daman thanks for coming on the podcast thank you very much for having me Kushal it's uh, it's an absolute pleasure all right so Tripur Daman let's start uh, this way so I would request you first to tell a bit about yourself to the listeners and the viewers of this podcast and uh, before we start discussing the book so so please go for it uh so in a nutshell i'm a historian uh who works on early modern and modern south asia and this uh this is my second book uh, i am current i did a phd in history at the university of cambridge uh, i am currently a british academy postdoctoral fellow at the institute of commonwealth studies in london and uh I wrote my first book last year on uh, on the transition from Mughal to British rule and this is my second book and I've kind of uh, decided now to focus on this very critical period in Indian history around you know the formation of the constitution and the transfer of power to uh, to the first democratic government so that's that's where this book has uh, come out of all right so triple seven let's start because this is my rule whenever i do a big book discussion my first question always is that you know obviously you're a historian you can probably write about many things but there had to be a particular stream of thought that made you go you know what i'm going to write about this so why don't you tell uh, us about the reasons that you picked this topic and you decided to dissect the historical period because the book is centered around the first year or or a few mm-hmm. days about our, our our the nascent stages of our republic so why did you mm-hmm. pick this topic uh, so i think there are, there are a few reasons um, one i i kind of drifted into it because i was uh, doing a bit of research on zamindari abolition and of course i kind of had to go into into the amendment and the more i read about it the more kind of incredulous i became because it's an aspect of our history a hugely hugely consequential aspect of our history which uh, which no one really talks about it's it's kind of brushed under the carpet uh, both i mean in public discourse and within the sort of academic intellectual spheres so i uh, there are a few reasons that i decided to write on it one was because i thought that it spoke to the present in in many ways um it almost i mean if you look at the debates and the issues involved it kind of it has it it mirrors many of the debates that have kind of been ignited in uh, in the public sphere now uh, secondly it 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 just the the sort of normal binaries in which we understand uh, indian history and politics you know the binary between right and left between you know nehru and mukherjee or between you know, authoritarian and liberal visions of india uh, this book kind of inverts all of these binaries to show that you know it's it's very that this sort of manichean black and white view of history uh, just doesn't exist um and thirdly i think it's uh, just just a sort of counterintuitive story where uh, this book sort of hits at so many foundational myths and uh, you know is is such a counterintuitive interesting story in itself that i think it needed to be told there was uh, there was kind of no way around it so i think all of those reasons kind of uh kind of came together and i decided that you know this would be this would be a great subject for 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 a book so the book is basically talking about three topics right so one of them is the famous first amendment of india which is uh, funny enough you know it's the complete opposite of the first amendment in the united states of america in terms of what 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 impact it has on the society and the political discourse at large the second uh, aspect of the book that you've covered is about obviously zamindari and the land reforms or whatever we have to do and the third is about the subject of reservations now uh, i want to keep uh, the first amendment part uh, for the later aspect of it but uh, let's start with the part on the reservations so 
So it's very interesting, and and I want to draw this because it's very hard because uh, we kind of when we read the book, you you know, it's it's three subjects being discussed parallelly, right? It's not like yeah. you discuss one, then you go to the other. It's always you know you're yeah. talking about all the three subjects parallelly, chapter by chapter. Now, mm-hmm. here's the thing. Now, the focus of this book obviously is Jawaharlal Nehru, but I I, I want to take it to a different angle where, I mean, obviously everybody knows about a famous book which uh, was written by Arun Shori, which was called Worshipping False Gods. It was on mm-hmm. Baba Sahib Ambedkar. Now, one may disagree with Arun Shori's uh, conclusions uh, depending on their on their leanings or their uh, reading. But my my... To me, the focus of this book was that it was not just about Nehru, right? The, when, when you were writing this book, what came across to me is, uh, so I, I don't want to talk to, about which I perceive to be the real hero of this book. and yeah. uh, But let's talk about the people who in a way broke my heart in different ways. So so here I'm obviously not not just about Nehru, but I'm talking about uh, Rajaji, Raja Gopalachari. Uh, mm-hmm. I'm talking about Sadar Patel. And I'm also talking about Baba Sahib Ambedkar. So, so can you give us different aspects in terms of these three uh, parallels about yeah. these three personalities first? Uh, okay, I, I think we should maybe start with Patel. Yeah. And uh, with Patel, what happens is uh, Patel has a certain ambivalence almost towards the idea of fundamental rights. He pilots the chapter in uh, as you know the as chairman of the advisory committee on fundamental rights he pilots that part of the constitution to the con- uh, through the constituent assembly and uh, he often uh, sort of almost counteracts the influence of jawaharlal nehru as well and you notice that in one of the letters where which i quoted length where you know uh, nehru writes to him saying he hasn't been hard enough on the RSS and the Hindu Masaba who are you know, triggering conflict with Pakistan. And Patel writes back, and it's a very instructive and very, uh, it's almost as if someone's writing back to a child who doesn't know the basics of constitutionalism. And he, uh, and he writes to Nehru saying, you know, now that we have a constitution, every executive decision must have legislative uh, sanction and uh, they can't go beyond constitutional boundaries. So it's quite clear that Patel very much understands what is at stake. He doesn't want to take these sort of shortcuts uh, to uh, you know to to have his own way, but on the other hand, Patel is also quite. You could say he's pragmatic. You could say he is. Uh, he's not particularly. Uh, he doesn't. He doesn't have any firm ideological commitment to uh, liberal democracy in in those sort of terms. So he's very clear that his job is the security of the state. And uh, he sees that as some as something that trumps uh, trumps any sort of commitment to uh, to individual liberty. And you notice that in his uh, in his writings, because he calls uh, at one point he calls fundamental rights a sort of result of um, you know, irrational exuberance. Uh, uh, he sort of laments the Supreme Court judgment in in uh, on the sort of freedom of speech cases, but he also seeks to sort of counteract Nehru in, on some of his excesses. So I think Patel makes for a very interesting figure, um, also because he dies before the amendment actually comes into being. So what might have happened if he had lived is, uh, it's a good question to ponder uh, whether the amendment would have taken the same form. We, we can't really say. Um, Ambedkar, I think, uh, again, um, he sees, and you, if you go back to his utterances in the Constituent Assembly, he uh, he keeps saying India is entering a sort of conflicted age where you have political equality, but you know social inequality, and I think he sees this as the kind of price to pay for substantive democracy. He sees it as that, on balance, uh, like Nehru himself. Ambedkar is a social revolutionary, and he mm-hmm. sees the sort of in his sort of seminal study of, of the Constitution. Granville Austin said the Constitution had, had there was a sort of seamless web that comprised the, con- the Constitution, which was once one was the strand of liberal democracy and individual freedom, one was the strand of social revolution, and one was the strand of sort of unity and integrity and security uh, of the new state. 
And like Nehru, uh, I think Ambedkar gave precedence to the kind of social revolutionary strand. So you can see in the book that Ambedkar isn't entirely comfortable with what's happening with freedom of speech, but I think he sees it almost on balance to achieve the broader sort of aims of social just justice. And, you know, I think he sees it as a price worth paying. Again, this is my feeling. Uh, we can't we can't tell with any degree of certainty. Uh, Rajaji, I think uh, Rajaji is is a bit disappointing. I think perhaps even he at that point hadn't quite seen as to how overbearing and conform sort of uh, uh, conformist Nehruvianism would uh, would become, and he again probably. Uh, we're talking of a period where Nehru's ascendance wasn't yet complete. So even though Patel had died, uh, the ouster of Tandan and the leaving of Rajaji was uh, was still something that hadn't been accomplished. So uh, I think he perhaps misjudged, uh, misjudged just how overbearing Nehruvianism could become. So it's, you know, there's something very interesting. I think it was page, yeah. So 11, could you talk about the uh, Sardar Patel? Uh, so you talk about it over here where you say the new preventive detention bill was hurriedly drawn up to bring the various security acts in the provinces into one central act conforming to the preventive detention provisions in the constitution. Advisory mm -hmm. boards were swiftly created, moving the bill in the parliament. Patel described it as an emergency legislation against communists who constituted a danger to the existence and security of the state, which, as he observed, cannot deal with them under the provisions of ordinary law. So what I have understood from, and if we remember correctly, and uh, correct me if I'm wrong, because obviously you're more yeah. qualified in this, I remember Patel and, um, you know, Patel also hardened the section 144. People don't realize that section 144.2, it was hardened by Patel in the first few years of the formation of the Republic. And at every mm -hmm. time the excuse given was uh, the partition, our national security, or oh, what if, you know, something like this happens and something like that happens. So uh, mm -hmm. do we have to give them the benefit of the thought that the trauma of the partition, especially in the case of Patel, who was the home minister and for him is prime responsibility and imagine getting all those hundreds of princely states together. Yeah. But do you think that in your view, it is worth the price that we paid in the form of giving up our liberties so easily that this bogeyman always and and it's consistently raised in the in the book. Yeah. The boogeyman is always oh ye aise kar denge. oh society toot jayegi oh this will happen oh that will happen. So do you think even in this case, like I just narrated this paragraph yeah. of the prevention yeah. detention bill, do you think every time this was kind of misused also? Uh, I think so. The thing is, these things have been very controversial even when uh, even when they were written into the constitution in the first place. So, uh, and if you read the paragraph after that, you'll you'll notice, and, and I quote one of the members from Assam, and yeah. who openly says that this is a black bill, and the only reason yes. that it's passing through parliament is because of Patel's personal assurance. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, it's quite clear that not everyone was comfortable with what was happening, and it's quite clear that not everyone bought the argument completely either. So, uh, but I think Patel saw it as uh, but I mean, once it had been written into the constitution, uh, I think he he saw it as being justified. Uh, we of course we can't forget that there were formidable threats. Of course, partition, but not only partition. There was armed rebellion uh, in uh, sort of armed communist rebellion in the south, in you know large swaths of the south, in Telangana, parts of Maharashtra, parts of uh, parts of Kerala. Uh, and ditto with uh, sort of threats in the sort of frontiers in the northeast, etc. Um, and again, something that we can't forget that it was Nehru who created the Armed Forces Special Powers Act to deal with disturbances in the northeast. So, yes, but uh, yes, there, in a certain sense, their sort of threat perception was skewed by their experiences with partition. Uh, but also, it was also skewed by a sort of commitment that they had to, and this went, uh, this, you know, sort of went beyond Nehru and Patel, it went through the sort of DNA of the Congress itself, to uh, to kind of claiming to be the successor of the British Raj, to the idea that they had inherited 
everything that the British had ruled. And uh, so uh, it was a kind of dictum. I don't know, uh, Perry Anderson sort of quotes this dictum in his book, The Indian Ideology, that uh, let what colonialism has bound together, let no one sort of tear asunder. So the Congress uh, as a party and as a sort of was ideologically committed to that idea of India, which, which had been fashioned uh, uh, fashioned under colonial rule. So I think they saw it, they saw any threat to it as uh, uh, as something that could trigger at any point could trigger you know balkanization of uh, uh, of the country. I think they they inherited these sort of colonial anxieties, which uh, they weren't able to let go of. The sort of Indian state wasn't able to let go of uh, quite easily. So those I think those are two major reasons uh, why they did. As for whether we made a mistake. I think we did, uh, I, and so did uh, so did many others. Yeah. So, so one particular paragraph in your book on page twenty one. This was, I think, where you you quote um, uh, the brother of the Congress stalwart C R Das and a former judge of the Patna High Court, where you quote him by saying, "We have in India today a one party state, just as Hitler's Germany was a one party state." Mussolini's Italy was one party state and Stalin's Russia is a one party state. The danger which I apprehend is that the government may suppress all political parties which do not believe in the Congress government on the plea that the interests of public order demand that these parties should be suppressed. I think this paragraph pretty much sums up what uh, what you're talking about because I just got yeah. my immediately reminded when you were talking about this. So now let's get into the Zamindari aspect. Now, what mm -hmm. is very interesting is that the courts were pretty liberal in the beginning time, right? The court would always yeah. rule against them. And uh, and so why don't you tell us about the interplay? Because I think what was happening in the case of the land reforms or the Zamindari thing, it was basically the whole idea for Congress and Nehru was we were elected because we told the electorate that we will deliver these zamindari reforms we will mm -hmm. deliver these land reforms and mm -hmm. they would constantly come up with legislations that were just constitutionally unsound if what i have gathered from the book yeah. so can you tell us a bit of a uh, bit about the tussle between the courts and the congress then yeah so uh, the the kind of story in in the book the zamindari story works on kind of two parallel tracks so you see that uh, there are two zamindari abolition legislations that are coming up one in up and one in bihar uh, in and they take sort of divergent uh, divergent routes so bihar is sort of more how should I, militant about it uh, they draft like a very cursory act it only has about you know sort of 30 uh, 30 or uh, clauses um, or somewhere between 30 and 40 clauses and they have a very peculiar a sliding scale of compensation. So, um, zamindaris of a certain size are given are to be compensated at a rate of I don't know twenty times their annual income. Zamindaris of a certain size are to be, you know, paid off at something like eight times their annual income. And the largest zamindaris, uh, which were um, Darbanga, Ramgarh, and all these, are to be compensated at a rate of three times their annual income. And uh, this sort of, even when they were drafting it, they, uh, I suspect they probably were aware they were treading, uh, treading, you know, into constitutionally dangerous territory because they had previously, they had formulated a temporary sort of act behind Estates and Tenures uh, Act, which was to take sort of manage, just purely management control of these estates and that had already been uh, struck down by by the high court so um, they, I, I feel like they were probably aware uh, just no one had thought that the courts would uh, would really take a strong stand in favor of constitutional provisions in up uh, where the government was led by govind balapant they were a lot more circumspect they drew up they were very careful in the act that they drew up uh, they had expansive measures of compensation. Um, and so when both acts kind of went to uh, went to the courts, um, the Bihar Act was struck down. Struck down not because it violated the, uh, the right to property, but it was struck down because it violated the right to equality. So 
and it violated that right to equality by virtue of prescribing different rates of compensation for different categories of landholders. So the court was like, court was very clear that the problem wasn't the idea of zamindari abolition or the idea of the state acquiring property, but the problem was the state discriminating between people of a certain class. So once it identified a class of people, it could not uh, treat them, you know, uh, differently. So it it it's found that that violated the right to equality before the law. And so this act was struck down as unconstitutional. Um, and there was almost, you know, panic in, in the Bihar government because, of course, politically and, you know, the Congress had staked a lot of political capital, as you mentioned, on the idea of Zamindari ab abolition. And their view was that this was why they had been elected. It was a core part of the Congress sort of social agenda. And they had to deliver it before they went to the people in terms of elections. So the Bihar government then sort of keeps asking for a constitutional amendment. Initially, Nehru reacts by saying, we're examining the situation. We're going to see what we can do. Uh, and then progressively, he he sort of goes, he becomes more and more sympathetic to the Bihar concerns that uh, uh, that this is why the Congress has been elected and they can't go back to the people to say when you know, the Constitution comes in our way. So Nehru writes openly by saying uh, that if the Constitution itself comes in our way, then it's time, uh, then it is time to change the Constitution. Um, and so it's quite clear that there are, there, are, there are two aspects to this. One, of course, a sort of ideological commitment to the ideas of Indari abolition. And the second is a more instrumental concern about the election itself as to what they would have to face if they went back to the public without having delivered uh, core parts of what they saw as their agenda or their manifesto. Now, I believe that argument was untrue and that my argument is borne out by the judgment of the Uttar Pradesh High Court, which held the UP Zamindari Abolition Act completely legal and it dismissed some 4,000 uh, applications against it. So that act clearly proves that we, um, uh, it, it sort of clearly proves that zamindari abolition as a principle was perfectly compatible with the constitution. Yes. And properly crafted zamindari abolition was not likely to meet uh, any major judicial roadblocks. Yes, it might be delayed by the fact that the court might spend you know three months hearing a case against it, but there was no fundamental sort of roadblock to zamindari abolition. But I think by that point, uh, by the time the UP judgment came. The other issues had also gathered steam, and uh, I think Nehru, encouraged by people such as uh, uh, such as Pandit Pant and you know some others in his uh, in his cabinet, had had kind of come to the conclusion that the core points of the Congress agenda should be taken beyond the purview of the judiciary, uh, and that kind of then of course leads to the amendment itself. Yeah. So now let's get into which I, I feel yeah, is. I'll stop you for one second. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, just just a quick another quick point about it was uh, yeah. the fact that no one felt that zamindari abolition was under threat. You have yeah. uh, the speaker of parliament, G. V. Mablanka. You have the leader of the opposition, Sham Prasad Mukherjee, and you have the president of the country, Dr. Rajendra Prasad, who had been chairman of the Constituent Assembly beforehand clearly like voicing the opinion to Nehru that the first step should be to bring the Bihar legislation into conformity with the constitution rather than seek to uh, you know seek to take the very serious step of a constitutional amendment so i think that kind of bears out what uh, the the point that i make yeah so so i kind of uh, get to summarize it was um, the problem was not with the concept of getting rid of zamindari the problem was the way they were doing it the the, the legality mm -hmm. behind it and the mm -hmm. ham-handed approach of the Congress government at that time. Yeah. And uh, the arrogance that, um, or to use Greta Thunberg style, how dare you, was the attitude of the <laughs> of the Congress yeah. at that time. Whenever the courts would strike them down, that the reaction of Nehru's government was like, how dare you? How dare you tell me? I am the hero. I am the freedom fighter. I went to jail. Yeah. Why, don't, why don't you let me do what I want to do? And, and what I saw in your book was the courts telling them all the time, Boss, even we want this to go. 
but we can mm-hmm. only follow the you know the constitution why don't you just draft a good bill in essentially yeah. uh, is that correct that's what the courts were telling them yeah in in a nutshell that's that's what the position was and i think you're right in that nehru was had had this sort of temperament and i think partly it was driven by the fact that drafting and passing a new bill would take them beyond the time uh, that they had before the first election uh, was to happen so you'll notice that finally the states that were facing these problems also obstructed the preparation for uh, uh, being uh, the preparation for the first election long enough that they had enough time for a, for a constitutional amendment so they wanted it, it wasn't simply that they wanted to do it they also wanted to do it there and then yep Yep, I I totally agree with you. So now let's get into my favorite subject. I mean, anybody who is a regular listener of this podcast will know that uh, when it comes to free speech, they will find one platform that will cry from morning to evening, twenty four by seven about freedom of expression. Like I am, uh, till the extent of annoying my listeners, obsessed with the idea of freedom of expression because we don't have it in India. And to me, what I loved about this book was you basically narrated. how we destroyed free speech in india and you literally quote <laughs> a, uh, the different players saying and uh, and these are not your words these are mine but this is how i felt every time i would read anything in this about you know whether you're quoting nehru or you're quoting other politicians and to me in my head you know hindi mein main kehta tha he nehru telling me dekho main tumhare sath kya karne wala hu and it, it was so depressing so it starts obviously with the supreme court verdict uh on uh, uh, you know on 26th may 1950 so again let's talk about the organizer case and even the madras uh, maintenance public order uh, act can you can you tell everybody a bit about both those cases first uh so there were these public safety acts were essentially uh mostly colonial legislation some of them had been amended uh, in the early sort of early years of independence as well uh, and they were there to basically control uh, the flow of information public order so you could uh, ban the circulation of magazines or you could ban publication of uh, newspapers you could censor uh, or what they used to call pre-censor so only pre-approved information pre-approved by the government could be printed in the newspapers or those magazines uh and they were also um similarly used to detain uh you know de- detain people found to be a threat to public order etc so they were this this sort of all purpose public safety uh, legislation and again the story begins very very early uh because there is a magazine called crossroads uh interestingly published by a gentleman named Ramesh Thapar uh who is or who was the brother of the distinguished historian Romila Thapar uh so Romila Thapar used to publish this magazine called Crossroads which was very left leaning and hugely critical of uh, of the congress uh, and its policy towards the communists who were being often been detained without trial and uh, the kind of offending period was when 200 communists who had been uh, arrested and detained in Madras were a uh, shot in the jail so uh, i i kind of described the incident in my book 200 of them were put into a kind of hall and the police opened fire on them uh, at point blank range and they killed uh, they killed quite a few of them and that kind of outraged uh, a lot of people including nehru and sardar patel uh, they sort of uh, nehru was particularly shocked but anyway so uh, thapar you know used that incident to mount a serious sort of uh, critical offensive in his magazine against the government and the government uh, the madras government responded by uh, banning its uh, circulation into madras state uh, so thapar not one to kind of take it lying down uh, you know appeal to his readers for funds and he then he took uh, took the matter to the supreme court because of course um, the constitution allows you should your uh, fundamental rights be threatened it allows you to take the matter up directly in front of the supreme court which is what thapar did uh, on the other side there had been a lot of rioting uh, and communal violence in bengal it had been triggered by a sort of state sponsored uh, almost a state sponsored 
genocidal violence in East Pakistan, which had triggered migration into West Bengal. And of course, then it had created a, a sort of communally charged situation in West Bengal, which, uh, and crucially, Nehru was being criticized for his handling of Bengal across the political spectrum, both left and right, and from within the Congress. Uh, Nehru suspected that Patel was backing his critics. So uh, this was something, and of course, Nehru also believed that much of the criticism was motivated by trying to, uh, as he writes to Radko Palchari, push him and bully him into, uh, into taking military action against Pakistan, which was something he did not uh, very, you know, very categorically did not want to do. So uh, Nehru, of course, retaliates. Um, and of course, you can't just say Nehru retaliates because the orders have to come from uh, from the Home Ministry for this. So you have a pre-censorship order against the RSS mouthpiece, the organizer. And uh, Kiar Malkani, again, who was uh, an RSS stalwart, who was then editor of the organizer, um, a very, very interesting man, um, coincidentally the first person to be arrested when Nehru's daughter Indra declared the emergency. Uh, Malkani, again, like Thapar, was not one to take this lying down. And he openly declares that uh, a government benefits more from the criticism of right-thinking citizens than the fulsome flattery of charlatans. Uh, I think that's what he says. And he takes the matter to the Supreme Court as well. And the two cases are kind of heard more or less side by side. And the Supreme Court finally rules that uh, the Freedom of Speech, Article 191, is uh, expansive. Uh, and the only grounds on which it can be restricted is uh, is if there is a threat to the security of the state so strong that there is a danger that the state may be overthrown. Uh, and public order is not uh, not one of the kind of provisions under which uh, the right to free speech can be restricted. So holding that, the state uh, countermands both, or the Supreme Court, sorry, countermands both orders. And it also strikes down the relevant provisions of the public safety legislations, both for Madras and uh, for Delhi. And of course, uh, that verdict is celebrated across the board in amongst the press, amongst, uh, uh, amongst the government's opponents as kind of laying down a core democratic principle that nothing that short of threatening uh, the security of the state to such an extent uh, that it uh, could result in the over overthrow of the state or public disorder to such an extent that it threatens the very foundations of the state uh, nothing you know nothing short of that is enough to restrict the right to free speech and uh, that again sort of really shakes the government up because they didn't want to be criticized in a nutshell. So, so, so some very interesting paragraphs I wanted to quote from your book when uh, so you directly quote the judgment where you say very narrow and stringent mm -hmm. limits have been set to permissible legislative abridgment of the right of free speech and expression and this was doubtless due to the realization that freedom of speech and of the press lay at the foundation of all democratic organizations so for without free political discussion no public education so essential for the proper functioning of the processes of popular government is possible. And then again, you quote uh, another part of the judgment. I think it's paid 82. Yeah. So you say the court observes governments may go and be caused to go without the foundations of the state being impaired. A law of addition, sedition thought necessarily during a period of foreign loon has become inappropriate by the very nature of the change which has come about. The limitation placed by clause two of article 19 upon interference with the freedom of speech is real and substantial. So long as the possibility of it, section 124A being applied for purposes not sanctioned by the constitution cannot be ruled out, it must be held to be wholly unconstitutional and void. Can somebody believe that something like this could have been said? Mm -hmm. in today's India, because in today's India, everybody is anti-national, everybody is tum adesh drohi, tum seditious, tum ye, and this is directly a court observation about the very article itself. So, so my question is actually slightly different. So when you were researching it, what went in your head when you're like, Bapre, we were talking about this and today is our country. 
So what did you feel? What were your initial uh, actions? You know, that's, a, that, that's a quote from the Tara Singh judgment where uh, yeah. the Congress critic and Akali Dal leader, Master Tara Singh, had been jailed for sedition. Mm. Uh, I think the, the thoughts that went through my head was just, I mean, two. One, the kind of eerie parallels almost with uh, with present day sort of discourse and politics just with the kind of roles being turned so now it's you know instead of the congress being in the hegemonic force in politics it's now on the other side uh, the second is uh, just how uh, vigorous i would say just how vigorous the courts were in that in the defense of the constitutional order uh, so i think they took they took their role very, very seriously as guardians of the constitution, and uh, they were not—they uh, were not to be intimidated by the executive in in any way. And this—I uh, mean, that's that quote is one of my favorite quotes because it it clearly shows what our, the original sort of constitution was all about. It was uh, it was a constitution for liberty and freedom. It was not uh, it was not a constitution. Uh, to empower the state, to kind of, uh, to sort of stamp on the citizens' rights. Yep. And and now to parallel this, I wanted to read a couple of quotes of Nehru. So mm -hmm. here you are on page 100 where you say, in Parliament, Prime Minister Nehru lambasted the press for its supposedly nefarious role in public affairs. Nefarious role in public affairs. May I also say that some periodicals in various parts of India fall very greatly below any standard of decency and legitimate criticism he thundered. And then you quote him, Indeed, it has amazed me to find to what depths these periodicals can fall and how they go on giving publicity to an amalgam of falsehood and indecency. Interesting word, indecency. Mm -hmm. I should say something about this false and malicious campaign. What I am especially concerned about is the degradation of some parts of our press. Here goes the government and the politician playing moral police all the time. As if, you know, oh, I'm supposed to be the forebearer of morality and all decency in society. So, mm -hmm. and, and I think in a couple of pages later, although this is in another context, you see uh, another quote, uh, quote by Nehru, where you basically say his patience exhausted a furious Nehru, addressed the press and blew the bugle for the battle. If the constitution is interpreted by the courts in a way which comes in the way of the wishes of the legislature in regard to basic social matters, then it is for the legislatures to consider how to amend the constitution so that the will of the people as represented in the legislature should prevail. Now, let's unpack these two quotes because mm -hmm. if you are a lover of liberty, it doesn't matter what side of the political aisle you really fall on. Yeah. I mean, for me, I am someone who loves liberty. I love freedom. Mm -hmm. I, and for me, even the freedom of the person I dislike matters as much as the freedom of the person I like matters. In fact, if you ask me, the real test of freedom only comes when you stand for the freedom of the person you mm -hmm. dislike the most or the ideas. So do, if there ever was a disaster on this standard, it's pretty much Jawala Nehru when we go through his quotes in this book. So, yeah. so how do we judge him in the annals of history? Uh, I think the only, the sort of best, there, there were, I mean, there are many, there are many positives to Nero as well. So I wouldn't say he, he was a sort of wholly, wholly negative figure, but uh, his image has been airbrushed and polished for so long that we, we are almost taught to forget that this side of him existed, uh, apart from, you know, some uh, sort of half-baked WhatsApp forwards that might come from from people who uh, so this is the, uh, this is one of the big problems with criticisms of Nehru is that there hasn't been or rather there hasn't maybe it's because there hasn't you know it hasn't isn't something that has been allowed uh, is to have a sort of more critical appraisal of of Nehru's role in public life and that's one of the reasons why the First Amendment is so important and these quotes reveal an aspect to Nehru that we like to keep hidden that we don't like to talk about and the thing is fundamentally. Nehru was an, a tremendously imperious, uh, imperious figure. He had a kind of procedural, almost pedantic commitment to democracy. So he wanted committees to sit. He wanted, like, wanted things to go through the sort of, 
uh, the sort of proper procedures almost. But one of the reasons why he could afford to do that was because he didn't have any costs to bear. He got what he wanted. They were packed with yes men. So they did what he told them to do. It, it, it didn't really matter that it had to undergo a democratic process. Parliament was going to pass what he wanted. Committees were going to pass what he wanted. Cabinet was going to rubber stamp what he wanted. And uh, these these quotes are just uh, are hugely important because it just shows you that the Indian sort of democratic experiment started to almost go wrong or be kind of started to really almost fall apart uh, almost from the word go. Yeah, and and you know another part to me and this this one hurts me the most in this book. I mean, we did talk about. But the capitulation of Rajagopalachari and Ambedkar on the free speech issue, that just, it just breaks your heart. Uh, it, it does. It does in a way. Yeah. It, 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 yeah. So, I mean, like on page 113, right? You, you, you write, this is the last paragraph of your chapter where you say, on his departure as India's last governor general, see Rajagopalachari had verbalized the establishment's desire to risk toward the unqualified reverence for the state that our ancients had cultivated, reverence for law and discipline. As Home Minister, it was now apparent how literal he had been. What this, this did the state of affairs say about the biggest liberal experiment in the democratic government? A decade before independence in a pseudonymous article, Jawaharlal Nehru had confessed to an intolerance of others and a certain contempt for the weak and the inefficient and warned that one day when he had executive authority, he could take advantage of his powers. Sweeping aside the paraphernalia of a slow moving democracy, could there have been a grain of truth in his statement? He had uh, he already had near complete dominance over the government and over the party were the constitution and the judiciary next. Now, let's talk about the role of Rajagopalachari, especially in concerns mm -hmm. with the free speech issue. Now here, you know, you listen to Rajaji, you see, oh, you know, India's first right of center liberal guy, very liberal on these things, but God damn, he was so anti-freedom of expression. So, I mean, nobody talks about it. I mean, I think your book was the first time I actually came across in it. And I, I'm telling you, when I was reading the book, you know, my mind was the only thing that my heart was broken, one thousand one here, one there, one there, kind of a feeling I was going through. So, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, Ra Rajaji is a, is a very interesting figure. The way we remember him is we remember the Rajaji of the late fifties and sixties as the kind of yeah. leading light of the Swatantra Party, you know, holding yeah. holding strong against the Nehruvian juggernaut. But uh, much before that, uh, Rajaji, we have to we have to realize was a kind of staunch staunch congressman who who bought into the idea that the Congress was the successor to uh, to the colonial state. So this is something again that nobody really sort of wants to talk about. But the Congress was as devoted to denying any other party the le the legitimacy to voice any shade of political opinion in India as it was to kicking the British out. Uh, one of the reasons why partition, of course, you know, uh, uh, many historians uh, argue that many, one of the reasons why partition became inevitable was the Congress's kind of refusal to uh, to grant the Muslim League any shade of legitimacy. So uh, for them, the idea had been that they were wholly legitimate and uh, you know could not be engaged with it at all. So they had that attitude not just to the Muslim League. They had that attitude to every other sort of political formation that uh, that that came about, and so Rajaji was very much a part, uh, you know, committed to that idea, uh, and so he his role in this is quite clear. He defends it in in Parliament. He uh, uh, kind of endorses it in cabinet. He even uh, seeks to kind of make all fundamental rights subject to martial rule. Uh, unfortunately, that idea doesn't really pass muster, uh, but it is voiced. And so I think uh, Rajaji kind of uh, saw, he saw the light too late is, is what, I, what I put. I think he's, he hadn't quite figured out how overbearing uh, Nehruvianism would become or quite what the consequences of the First Amendment would be at, uh, at that point. Crucially, it's also worthwhile to remember that uh, Rajaji uh, as to how Rajaji left 
the Nehru cabinet. He left it to go and become chief minister of Madras because in the first election, the Congress had not won a majority in the Madras assembly. And Rajaji left because he was the only person who could engineer enough defections from other parties to cobble together a Congress majority. That is why he was sent to uh, uh, sent to sent to Madras. So much before, you know, today we're all talking about Sindhya and Pilot. Uh, much before Sindhya and Pilot, the first uh, the first experiment in kind of engineering defections and breaking other parties to form uh, to form a government was spearheaded by Rajgopal Chari in Madras. Yeah. So now let's get into uh, the the other disappointment. Again, it's just shocking because for me, Ambedkar was the one who drafted the the free speech clause mm -hmm. in the first place, and you know Ambedkar was the man who gave us freedom of expression and. Then the complete turn, where it's very interesting, a line you use on page 157, where you write, the legal correspondent for the Times of India accused Law Minister Ambedkar of trying to be too clever by half in censoring the Supreme Court for refusing to support his doctrine of implied police powers and published long extracts of his speeches of the Constituent Assembly in 1948 to demonstrate how he had gone back on his own claims. In 1948, mm -hmm. Ambedkar has categorically asserted before the Constituent Assembly that instead of formulating fundamental rights in absolute terms and depending on the Supreme Court to invent the doctrine of police powers and read limitations into them, as happens in the United States, they were going to directly write such restrictions into the Constitution itself, forestalling the need or ability of the Supreme Court to invent any doctrines. Having made such a statement in the Constituent Assembly, in the correspondence opinion for the law minister to now demand implied police powers were nothing short of dishonesty. So what happened with Ambedkar, man? Uh, I, well, Ambedkar made that claim in the Constituent Assembly. Uh, and this is a very, very interesting, very damning uh, sort of editorial in the Times of India. Uh, but that is, again, crucially not a claim made solely by Ambedkar. So very recently, uh, the political theorist Madhav Posla wrote a book called India's Founding Moment, where he sort of theorized that one of the reasons the Indian constitution is so long was because everything was codified. The reason that they wrote everything down was to try and limit the sort of uh, uh, personal discretion or whims and fancies uh, available to, uh, to both politicians and judges. And so this is precisely the claim that Ambedkar made in the Constituent Assembly, that they were writing everything down so that they didn't have to depend on the court, you know, inventing restrictions on fundamental rights, uh, as has happened in the US, where the Constitution, you know, has a bare sort of 14 acts giving, you know, an absolute freedom, uh, absolute right to freedom of speech. Uh, so Ambedkar goes back on his word, I think partly Ambedkar is often, I feel, forced to defend things that he doesn't entirely agree with. And I think on balance, he feels that uh, the kind of social revolution demands that the liberal and democratic element, you know, face a few, a few further restrictions. And him, you know, Ambedkar himself, uh, I think, I would, I, I'd probably say he wasn't 100% in agreement with what was happening. And you see that when after he, because very soon after, uh, after the amendment, you know, he's gone, he's, he's, he sort of leaves the, uh, after the Hindu court bill sort of fiasco, he leaves there was government. And then he represents Zamindars in court where he argues more or less, again, the opposite of what yeah. he has argued in parliament uh, in favor of the amendment. So I think that probably implies that Ambedkar saw it as either something that he was forced to do because once he left government, he did insinuate at certain points in time that he was forced to do certain things uh, against his better judgment. Uh, or perhaps he saw it as a price worth paying in the interests of, uh, of social justice. Um, yeah, I mean, so one, your one, one, fine. yeah, so one interesting point that I was totally shocked about too in the book was that this whole reasonable restrictions aspect, mm -hmm. you know, that they added that as a compromise. The original yeah. draft was far more dangerous. The original draft was like, jo hum bolenge wo sahi, jo tum bolenge wo galat. and this yeah. was 
sort of a compromise. Imagine, matlab, and Raja ji was okay with that too, by the way. <laughs> that was he was a shock to me. He was. Uh, and uh, so was Nehru. And in yeah. fact, uh, the only reason they peddled back was because significant numbers of Congress MPs uh, were growing restive uh, over that provision because that provision basically gave blanket uh, blanket right to the gov- government to uh, amend to restrict fund- the right to free speech as and when they felt like. Uh, so reasonable was uh, was was introduced as a compromise. Uh, to Ambedkar's credit, he was one of the major figures who kind of pushed for uh, the retention of the word reasonable. And uh, you have Nehru openly writing, to, and I quote his letter to uh, T.T. Krishnamachari, yeah. where he says, uh, I don't like the word reasonable before the word restriction, <laughs> but uh, uh, because, and he's very clear, he doesn't like it because it will allow the courts to judge the reasonableness of the legislation that they're passing. Uh, yeah. But, uh, you know, unfortunately, I think he, he, he gives in because he, he sees it as the only way to uh, kind so of avoid I'll, I'll read the quote for our viewers and listeners. So it's on page 158 where you say, so far as I can see, the courts have always had the right to consider any legislation. It is true that if this amendment is passed, they will somewhat they will be somewhat restricted in their interpretation. But I feel that putting the in the word reasonable would be an invitation for every such case to go to the courts with ensuing uncertainty. Wow, Shabbat Jawalan Wah. That was the, that was the attitude. But also, it's a bit facetious when he says, you know, they will be somewhat restricted because actually what would have happened is that they would have been more or less entirely restricted. Yeah, uh, it's, it's just, it was a shocker. Now let's go into, and this again, this was a shocker to me. I mean, the one hero of freedom mm-hmm. of expression in India at least that we get from this book is the so-called founder of the so-called fascist party of India, right? Yeah. Shama Prasad Mukherjee, the unabashed hero till the last breath in his body, till the last minute, till even after the amendment was passed, the one man who consistently kept on fighting. And, and you know, you talk about it on page 165, where you say in his minute of uh, dissent, S.P. Mukherjee strongly questioned the need for any further restrictions on the freedom of speech and expression. And you quote him, the onus of proving the need for changes has not been satisfactorily discharged. He argued the main reason advanced was that the judiciary had pronounced its opinion on certain laws which were disfavored by the government. The existing restrictions on the right to free speech and expression were more than sufficiently restrictive and there should be no fresh additions to these restrictions he urged. And the word public order must be subject to the clear and present danger test, namely that the substantive evil must be extremely serious and the degree of imminence extremely high. And then you again, uh, on page 176, the you talk about, uh, uh, you know, you say in spite of the opponents of the bill being in minority, Mukherjee argued vehemently against the revalidation of repressive laws originally created to stifle Indian freedom under colonial rule, warning that they were sounding the death knell of democracy. And you quote him again, we are giving more powers to parliament to enact more laws restricting freedom. He censured his colleagues. I submit that this is a completely wrong approach to the problem. But in any case, he remonstrated with the government, the power which you are now taking is not power which is necessary for any emergency that has arisen in the country, but for perpetuating certain lawless laws which our British masters had forced for the purpose of curbing freedom in India. This is what we are doing. I mean, when I read this, I was like, my hero. Because this is every day... I cry about this, that these laws are third rate and they kill our freedoms. I mean, what happened to the BJP then? (laughs) Uh, Good question. I think, uh, I think had Mukherjee lived longer to shape, uh, shape the party's uh, position and shape the party's uh, orientation, I feel they would have had a stronger sort of liberal emphasis. And I don't think Mukherjee's ideological position is in any way incompatible with uh, uh, with liberalism the way you and I see it. Uh, yes, it's not compatible with the sort of Nehruvian ideal, 
But uh, the Peruvian ideal, as you know, as I kind of make out in my book, is also quite corrupted. It's not a sort of uncorrupted, uh, genteel sort of ideal. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, Mukherjee comes out. This is an aspect of Mukherjee I feel is completely neglected, even by those who are his ideological heirs and those who subscribe to uh, to him as a sort of uh, sort of look up to him as a sort of political hero, which he undoubtedly was. Uh, this is an aspect of his thought uh, and of his political life that is often forgotten. And I think this is a hugely sort of important aspect of his book and one that I think uh, should provoke more discussion and and debate. And again, uh, he he kind of he leads he leads the opposition to the bill in Parliament. Uh, yes, there are others. There are uh, you know there are powerful speeches by Acharya Kriplani by Hedenat Kunzru, by, uh, you know, certain figures within the Congress who kind of rebel, uh, you know, KK, KK Bhattacharya who rebels, H.V. Kamat, uh, and, you know, someone like sort of Shtibban Lal Saxena. They're, they're very powerful speeches, but uh, a lot of the debate happens, and you see this towards the end, where you have, you know, a very, very heated exchange between Nehru and Mukherjee. Uh, is he he leads the sort of counterattack against the bill and what you see is the sort of very principled uh, very principled opposition that Mukherjee leads because many of them figures like Kriplani figures like Kunzuru uh, figures like Kamath were you know uh, in, in sort of ideological terms were diametrically opposite but that didn't stop them from making common cause in what they saw as the larger interests uh, of the country and uh, many, it's at one point I often uh, at one point I also quote where I say uh, the sort of opposition led by Mukherjee, but also outside Parliament by organizations such as the you know, bar councils, uh, bar associations, even the Federation of Indian uh, Chambers of Commerce and Industry. Uh, it's today sort of a next to impossible for their you know their descendants, uh, ideological and professional to even uh, uh, to hold the views that they did. Um, yeah, I agree with you. And it's very interesting. You spoke about uh, the, the bitter conflict and uh, war of words between Nehru and Mukherjee on page 184, where in this, uh, <laughs> this paragraph, you say, Nehru shaking his fist in fury charged Mukherjee with making false statements and scandalous speeches. And then you say, because so Mukherjee says, because your intolerance is scandalous, came Mukherjee's repost. It has become a fashion, become the fashion in this country for some people to go about in the name of nationalism and in the name of liberty to preach the narrowest doctrines of communalism, growled Lehru. And then Mukherjee replies by saying, you are an arch communalist responsible for the partition of this country. So yeah, so yeah, the words were pretty harsh on the floor of the house between the two of them. It is very interesting how how much cutthroat uh, their their uh, debates were. But eventually, now you know. Now let's come to the present day before we wrap things up because I'm conscious of your time. So, um, over the years, basically, step by step, brick by brick, inch by inch, we have you know, made these laws from bad to worse. I mean, today you you just, you know, we are now slowly becoming a republic of hurt sentiments. You know, I mean, uh, you make a movie where you caricature lawyers, lawyers will petition our sentiments are hurt. You make a movie caricaturing a historical figure from the past or even a current historical figure or a figure or famous figure, oh, my sentiments are hurt. You criticize religion. Religious sentiments are hurt. You criticize this, this sentiments are hurt. But none of us actually know why and how these very steps were done. But then as an Indian today, when we look at all of this, do you see any hope or do you see any light at the end of the tunnel where we kind of can come out of this mess that we've created for ourselves? I think it's... It's, it's quite hard because once certain things kind of, uh, I mean, in history and in, in sort of political theory, we have, we often use a term called path dependency. And the idea is that once you legitimize uh, and normalize 
certain things, they acquire almost a sort of life of their own. And uh, Mukherjee hints, his, hints at this in his speech. Uh, there's a portion where he, where I quote him, and he's quoting from an old English tract from the 1700s uh, called the Letters of Jun, Jun, the, the Letters of Junius, where he says, "Don't let any infraction of your liberty uh, pass without a determined, persevering existence, because very soon each precedent becomes law, and each law then builds on the on the previous precedent." And uh, in this, uh, Mukherjee was entirely correct. Uh, at another point, he warns Nehru, uh, and I think this is one of my favorite lines because it's something that you know, every uh, everyone deserves to hear. Where he very patiently tells Nehru, "Maybe you will rule, uh, you know, maybe you will rule all your life for generations after and generations unborn, but what happens if someone else?" Uh, comes into power. What is the precedent that you are setting for them? And uh, I think that's uh, that's something that we need to remember because each precedent kind of normalizes and justifies uh, a sort of something else happening, which is a, a, an almost greater infraction uh, of uh, of liberty. And I and I I once I had an interview with uh, with Huffington Post on uh, where they you know sought to discuss uh, discuss sedition. And they wanted to, and the interviewer asked me whether there were any parallels between Nehru and uh, and Prime Minister Modi. But as I said, the thing is, if there are parallels, the thing is, the legal tools have already been fashioned by uh, by someone else. So you know, if somebody wants to, uh, you know, wants to twist the constitution, or if somebody wants to clamp down on liberty, then the legal tools are all there. They've all been created. Uh, uh, nobody, uh, nobody now needs to mount a sort of assault on the constitution of the kind that Nehru or Indira Gandhi mounted, because they, Nehru has already left the legal tools for suppression of uh, of liberty, and he, uh, and it's it's a sort of very ironic line that he uses in Parliament, where he says, "We don't want to use these tools, but you know, we want to give something to the succeeding parliaments and the younger generations." Uh, and so, you know, he's he's given this to us. What we make of it is now dependent uh, dependent on our own selves. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more with you. It's just uh, what people don't realize, in my view, and and I don't know how to break it to many people over here. I always say this: there is no political outfit that likes freedom of expression in India. Mm -hmm. We have authoritarians of different hues and different kinds in India. Mm -hmm. uh, and the worst part is that the voters mm -hmm. of these are different shades of authoritarianism in India. Like I have never hidden my voting uh, options. I I have never. I I don't hide it. But the point is that I am a man who loves liberty, who loves freedom, and the way liberty and freedom is devalued in India, where you know, oh, how can you say something about a prime minister? How can you say something about my beloved person as? So actually, I don't know. I mean, these are such, I say it openly, medieval mindsets in a very, very weird way. You know, these kind of witch hunts that we have. And then when I read your book and I was like, Oh, ye beej boya tha. Hmm. Boya beej aur dekho, ye abhi ban gaya hai aur They are so deep rooted that yeah. when a person like me, when I oppose this, and you know, I, I say it openly, I'm a BJP voter. I, I mean, it's not a crime, right? In a democracy, you can be very open about your voting options. But to BJP vote base, you'll be like, oh, tum to pagal ho, tum ye ho, tum wo ho. I mean, what the hell are we doing in this country? And then, you know, I hope and pray that every young Indian, because I do have a lot of young people, you know, who watch this podcast yeah. on YouTube or they listen to the audio version. I just hope young people read this and they realize how we lost our freedom then. And you know, before we wrap things up, I think your last paragraph was fitting where you say India has often been said to be flirting with authoritarianism. Yet this was not always so. There was once a time before authoritarianism became enshrined in its constitution when India also flirted with liberalism. At that moment, Mukherjee had warned Nehru to stick with the original constitution that he was creating legal tools that one day be wielded by his opponents 
that his rule of that of his ideological co-travelers would not be eternal. It is a warning that every government has and every citizen would do well to remember. I think better words could not have expressed the entire destruction of free speech in India. I think Mukherjee was right. And you know what the irony is, Tripur Daman? His own successors today, the very party that I vote for, and I say this without any shame, they are doing the same things that Mukherjee had warned everyone about. Where some kid says, Pakistan, Zindabad, Hindustan, Zindabad, and that kid is sent to jail for just uttering Pakistan, Zindabad. I am surely not for that kind of liberalism. So, you know, once again, Tripur Daman, and, and I mean every word of this. Thank you for writing this book. I sincerely hope each and every kid reads this, adult and kid. And, you know, I've gifted this book to many friends. I've literally tried to gift this book to friends. I was like, padho, dekho kaisi barbadi hui hai hamari. And, uh, you know, once again, thanks for coming on the podcast and enlightening us with this amazing book. Thank you so much for having me. And uh, it's it's been an absolute pleasure. And I do hope a lot of people read this book because it's 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 the kind of story that kind of forces you to pause and think and assess, you know, everything that you uh, that is commonly believed about our constitutional history, about our political history, and about these, you know, huge figures, Mukherjee, Nehru, Patel, Ambedkar, Raja. It, it kind of really forces you to reassess uh, what what we what we've been taught, uh, and the uh, I sort of I'll end with one of uh, Jayaprakash Narayan's quotes, where he says basically says you know there's a there's a huge failure of the Indian public to associate freedom with the idea of their own liberties rather than uh, with uh, you know opposition to foreign rule and i think that in a nutshell that is uh, that is something that uh, that is still work in progress absolutely couldn't agree more so guys i have left the link to buy the book in the description of the podcast it's very simple you know the drill you just go in the description click the link buy the book I would encourage not just to buy the book. Well, say you read the book. I want you guys to discuss this book with people because when we have discussions uh, after reading books, that's when real changes happen. And if possible, buy more copies, gift it to your friends, make people read it. And before we wrap things up, you know the drill, guys. If you like what I'm doing over here, please subscribe to the channel, like the video, share it, buy the book. Also, if you like what my, my work over here, Please, if you want to support me on YouTube, you can join the membership program. If you want to support me on Patreon, you can support me on Patreon too. Until then, namaste, take care, goodbye. I'll see you next time. Thank you.